jump into 1 Corinthians. Originally, it's a letter of overall written by Paul, the apostle that was specifically gifted and called to go to the Gentiles or non-Jewish people to preach the gospel that Jesus had died, was buried, and rose from the dead, defeating our sins and eternal death. This letter to the, was written to a church in the city of Corinth, and the city was very blessed geopolitically, making it very prosperous, which led to fornication, adultery, sex outside of marriage, so much so that the word Corinthians became synonymous with the term fornication, or fornicating. <laughs> so the Corinthian church struggled with sin or evil acts against God, leading to Paul writing this letter. This chapter 10 specifically focuses on how Corinthians can learn from the Israelite mistakes of idolatry, sexual morality, and complaining in the history of the nation of Israel. Paul points out how the Israelites were a type or foreshadowing of how we might behave before God, showing how the Israelites were similarly baptized, shared food and drink like communion, and had Christ the rock with them. With that, can I get a reader to read verses 1, 2, and 3 for me up here, this first section? And uh, we've got Galaxo. Is that how you say it? Just ga- call him Galaxo. Galaxo. Just call him Galaxy. <laughs> Galaxo. Galaxo. Go ahead and read 1, 2, 3. Uh, where it says 1, more over. Just the entire Second, thing of it. Uh, Just right here. Just this. Uh, Alright. Yeah, one more over, <clears throat> brethren. If I, if I mispronounce some things, it's because I'm stupid and I have a smooth brain, so yeah. Uh, All good? Uh, 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 Christian? Uh, Christian can, uh, NKG. Uh, okay, okay, man. Okay. Uh, Corinthians 10, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> uh, 10, uh, NKJV, moreover, brethren, okay, I'll give up. Okay, can I get another reader? How about try, uh, King, um, Gohan. King Gohan, King Gohan might want to. Uh, I think, I'm sorry, I don't uh, I'll do Ray Poke, because Ray Poke came forward earlier, so let's do that. Uh, please read one, two, and three for me, please. No problem. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. Amen. So, what... what... What is Paul referring to here? A lot of us don't have Jewish backgrounds and you know in the, in the back of their heads, so I'm gonna kind of try to go over it real quick. Since Paul was a Jew, the reference to all our fathers is referring to the Jewish people and how as the nation of Israel, they were guided by God out of Egypt into the promised land by a cloud. Or as Exodus 13:21 puts it, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night so when leaving Egypt all the Israelites went through the Red Sea to escape the Egyptians and their armies which is recorded in Exodus 14 verses 21 through 23 then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind that all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand and the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen but then we get into the verse 2, where it's starting to talk about being baptized into Moses. What does baptism mean? Uh, so the Greek word that, you know, originally this was written in Greek, not English. The Greek word baptism. 
baptizo means literally to dip under, but practically meant to submerge or cleanse by submerging. However, beginning with John the Baptist, it became a public way to declare you were cleansing yourself of your old way of life by repenting of it and committing yourself to God. You know, First Peter 3.21 clarifies that it was not the physical removal of dirt, but the public act of wanting a good conscience toward it's God that matters. And I quote, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So both the cloud and the sea that we've been talking about is uh, were means of protecting the Israelites. Um, <laughs> when we get baptized, we start a covenant relationship with God, a.k.a. we make an agreement with God that he is our Lord and Savior from now on. When the Israelites walked through the Red Sea and followed the cloud by Moses' command, that signified their covenant relationship with God, too, being symbolically washed of their Egyptian way of life. Walking through the Red Sea was a public commitment to follow Moses, who God was using as the mediator of the first covenant which was given to the Israelites also known as the law that the Israelites had that first covenant was that if they follow God's commands or laws they would be blessed and if they didn't they would be cursed and, if, and please mute yourself if uh, please uh, warning one I, I really appreciate you coming back but please mute yourself Thank you. Uh, uh, Walter, Eden. So I'll go ahead and continue on when talking about how the first covenant that Israel was given was that if they followed God's commands or laws, they would be blessed. And if they didn't, they would be cursed. So Jesus, though, he comes into the picture and fulfills the law, making the old covenant obsolete, the old agreement between God and man. And now Jesus mediates a new covenant with us, where if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior over your life by paying for the punishment of your sins, death, with his own death on the cross, then you may have eternal life with God in heaven. And that's amazing. That's such a better covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 through 12 talks directly about how Jesus is the new mediator for the new covenant that was needed. Because the old covenant, the law that Israelites had, wasn't good enough uh, that, you know, uh, basically. So I quote, but now he was has obtained a more excellent ministry, in as much as he, Jesus, is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, According to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Amen. Right? God no longer remembers uh, the... <laughs> I don't appreciate those comments, uh, and please keep yourself muted during the teaching. But it's amazing that when you ask for forgiveness, that you, that God remembers those sins no more. 
And that's what allows him to allow uh, be in his presence, his gloried, perfect presence in heaven that is so bright and so powerful, acts as the new light source um, instead of the sun, which I think is so cool. If you start reading, I think, Revelation. Continuing on, so now that the new covenant mediated by Jesus lost in and lost is to be forgiven, we get to see that all ate the same spiritual food. He's starting to try to refer to the covenant, the communion a little bit, but we're going to talk a little bit about how the nation of Israel, full of Jews, ate a bread that rained from heaven, actually. Exodus 16.4 records, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So, in a way, we all eat the same spiritual food today, too, because Jesus is the bread of life in John 6.35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Because... Jesus even answered Satan in Matthew 4.4 4, that, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, you know, the bread that Jesus is talking about is the words that come out of him because Jesus was fully God on earth. So let's get another reader for verses 4, 5, and 6, please. <laughs> um, and we've got Lily Ender Dragon. Let's go for that. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, and go ahead and read verses 4, 5, 6. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual walk that followed them, and that walk was Christ. But with most of them, God was not very, not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lust, lusted. Thank you for reading. I really appreciate it. Helps break up my monologuing, right? <laughs> and also, it's really nice to not be alone up here. Um, when we look at verse 4, they're talking about all drinking of the same drink. Israel also drank of water that came from a rock that followed them around. That's why I was talking about the rock. Exodus 17.6 says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. So in a way, we all today drink the same spiritual liquid because Jesus' words are like water that give eternal life, as Jesus describes in John 4.14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, when we get to verse 5, the Israelites, when God talks about not being pleased, the Israelites did not follow God's orders a lot. Even when they were told to gather just enough bread in the morning for each day, some gathered extra, which the next morning would stink and be full of worms, which was a pretty mild judgment compared to how God judged other sins. But specifically, what's Paul most likely referring to? The Israelites longed to return to Egypt. Even today, we, you know, we need to remember that we shouldn't long for our old way of life, as Jesus says in Luke 9.62. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So, the Israelites also carried idols with them, which God directly calls out in Amos 5, verses 25 through 26. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried Silkoth, your king, and Chion, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. So, 
when it is talking about their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, uh, that's referring to the desert. It's most likely referring to when God judged Israel for being scared of the city of Jericho by having them wander in the desert, desert for nearly four decades. Numbers 14, 29 through 30 phrases it. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means unto the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Now, what's wild about this is when you look at Numbers 146, there were 603,550 people, men specifically, over 20 years old. If we double that to include women, that would probably be around 1.2 million. Then if we divide that by 38 years of wandering in the wilderness, that suggests an average of 90 deaths per day. That's, that's talk about being, having their bodies scattered in the wilderness. And this is the biggest understatement, one of the biggest understatements in the Bible, because out of a, a million people, only two Adults, Caleb and Joshua, made it to the promised land because God was not pleased with his people's idols and their constant complaining. So, can we go ahead and get another reader for verses 7, 8, and 9 while we think about how we, if we're like the Corinthians and learning from the Israelites, should learn not to complain in our own lives and be content like Paul was. Uh, it looks like I have Cornball Heedy. Uh, you, you've got your hand raised, right? Hold on. Okay. Go ahead and read 789. Yeah, no, no worries. Hold on, I gotta get my phone. Sorry, okay. so sorry. My, my phone was my microphone. Ah, perfect. Uh, go ahead and read 789. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. Um, I'm unorganized. All right. Anyways, and do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, <clears throat> as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Thank you for reading. I really appreciate it. Uh, do not become idolaters is how it's phrased for idolaters, but you're, you're, everything else is great. When we talk about idolatry, right, right <laughs> it's going to be Paul's quoting Exodus 32, 6, where they were having a festival to a molded golden half they worshipped while Moses was on the mount getting the Ten Commandments from God. Which is wild to think because they had just escaped from Egypt where God basically sent ten plagues of sorts um, to the Egyptians to convince them to let the people, the Jewish people go from the nation of Israel because the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt basically. Uh, unrightfully so in my opinion. The Israelites ended up substituting playtime for prayer time, indulging in escaping Egypt instead of the reality that they're going, they still need to go into the promised land. Keep in mind also that greed or covetousness is a form of idolatry, according, according to Colossians 3.5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness gives rise to all their sins, by the way. You know, coveting what someone else has, just being jealous somewhat, could also be another word for that. Um, and that's accord. And covetousness gives rise to all other sins, according to James 1, 14, 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth forth, brings forth death. <laughs> 
So, but, you know, we don't want to fall into idolizing uh, or becoming greedy if we can. And by the way, adult uh, uh, adultery um, is, or sorry, not adultery, being in, <laughs> idolizing something too much is where you are worshiping something above God. And so when the moment that you're spending more time, you know, on TV, just being a couch potato than you're spending with God is a moment to consider, hey, am I idolizing being greedy for TV instead of God? So something to consider and pray about on your own time. But let's go ahead and continue to verse 8, uh, where it talks about... Um, this is a reference to Numbers 25, one, verses 1 through 9, uh, when it's talking about 23,000 fell due to sexual immorality. The people of Israel were not to worship other idols or commit adultery by having sex outside of marriage, but the people of Israel actually paid women from Moab to have sex and bowed down to a god of the Moabites called Baal of Peor. P-E-O-R. God judged Israel by giving them a plague and told them to kill those who were joined to Baal of Peor, which killed 20-some thousand people. Now, if you're doing your own study, although Numbers 25.9 says, and those who died in the plague were 24,000, which doesn't match Paul's 23,000 statement here, Paul may have had access to more historical scrolls in that day and known that it was 23,000 in one day, whereas the 24,000 may have died in total in the days following. So, and that would make uh, explain the difference, to me at least. When we get to verse 9, where it's talking about, you know, they were were being destroyed by serpents uh, because the this is referring to how the Israelites spoke against God, which was judged by venomous serpents in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 6. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people came very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? But there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Eventually, the people repent, actually, for speaking against God, and God has them look to a brazen serpent on a cross to be spared from the plague, which is explained in John 3, 14-15 as a foreshadowing of how people will be spared in the new covenant mediated by Jesus. I quote, and as Moses lifted up 14 as he even so the, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And to me, that foreshadowing from that story of the brazen serpent, it shows that this is, is the Bible is a holistic package. And that history was pre-planned by God outside of our time domain, which I think is amazing and allows me to have more faith and trust in God who knows the beginning from the end. So let's get another reader for verses 10, 11, and 12. Come forward. <laughs> I, 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 oh, do you have a question? Usually I take questions after service, but I'll, uh, if it's a quick one, go ahead and ask it. Yeah, about the snake on the cross. Would that mean mm -hmm. you're talking about the copper snake on a pole? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I, I think it, I thought it was bronze, but maybe I'm misremembering. Um, but yeah. Um, and then uh, King Gohan, do you want to read? Because I see you came forward. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just don't know how to read. No, no, you're good. <laughs> uh, who else would like to read? Uh, forgetful Ferret. Go for it. Go ahead and read 10, 11, and 12. Uh, 
the destroyer. Now all of these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Wow. All right. So let me go ahead and mention that <laughs> numbers, when he's talking about complaining, one of the worst offenses of complaining was in Numbers 16, 41 through 49. Whereas verse 41 says, on the next day, all the congregation of, of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. This was directly after Korah, a direct descendant of Levi, wanted to lead instead of Aaron and Moses, who were appointed by God and got judged by having all who stood with Korah swallowed up by the the earth. And all 250 men who were offering incense with Korah's group were also consumed with fire. So the complaining that God killed those who were against his appointed Moses and Aaron then caused God to judge them with a plague that Aaron had to stop by burning incense between the healthy and unhealthy. Number 1649 said, now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So a lot more died by complaining than those few who rebelled is the point to take away. And so something to really consider. Don't try be content. You know, go ahead and go to per God in prayer with whatever your circumstances are. But in them, you know, don't get to a place where you're now complaining and whatnot like the Israelites did. Because God doesn't appreciate that as far as I can read here. So we'll go ahead and uh, talk about how in verse 11, the <laughs> it's, you know, Paul is saying that we should use these as examples, right? And I kind of referred to that earlier, um, that we are supposed to use Israel as our example of how to live um, and what God likes and doesn't like. So, Let's not have idols that we put as more important than God. Idols could be physical statues, but Americans tend to struggle more with money, careers, and social endeavors becoming idols. The moment those things are more important than loving God, it is an idol. Rega reading the Old Testament, therefore, from this you know, verse is more than just history. The Corinthians were to see their own reflection in the mirror of these historical events. Do we? And then God is immutable, a fancy word for meaning unchanging over time. And so he, if he's unchanging between the Old Testament and New Testament, then what God hates here, he'll hate today. God hates evil but over and over again proves that he loves the evildoer, the, the sinners that we all are. And so we, should, we need to be similar. God hates evil but loves the evildoer. Do we hate evil but love the evildoer? And that's something to consider as well. And when we get to verse 20, or sorry, 12, I can totally count. <laughs> Therefore, let him think he, he stands. Take heed lest he fall. The phrase he stands um, is kind of like a prideful, like, I will survive whatever is going on. I will make it through. And so I, I warn you, pride can hurt, especially and if, uh, while we're going through Proverbs. There's so many verses talking about how pride hurts. But King Nebuchadnezzar took pride in his work and is a great example for us. He took pride in his ability to lead the nation of Babylon, but really he needed to recognize that God was the one that gave Nebuchadnezzar success. The judgment for pride actually came so quickly in Daniel 4, verses 30 through 31, where, and I quote, the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling for my, by my mighty power, for the honor of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. 
<laughs> this begs the question, where do you think you have built up something for yourself? Your knowledge, your career, your, your money, all these things were given by God, just as God gave Nebuchadnezzar Babylon, the whole nation. Recognizing that everything we have is by God's grace makes it harder to become prideful. Can I get another reader for verse. Uh, can I get another reader for verse thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen over here? Uh, I think silver is up for the task. Go ahead and read for me, uh, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right. No temptation has overtaken you except, except such as common. No, sir, sir, uh, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, we also made the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourself what I say. Great. Thank you for reading. I really appreciate it. Um, when we get into verse 13, I think that is w a wonderful promise. What a relief to know that God has set limits for how much we'll be tempted. This also implies, though, that temptation will come. And it is not a unique experience. Some temptations are common to man or mankind, as other translations will say. Jesus can empathize with us, though, because he has experienced every temptation, according to Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize with us, with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. <laughs> now a clarification, though, is that temptations come from Satan, as seen when Satan tempts, uh, Job, in the whole book of Job, basically. All temptations do not come from a God, according to James 1, verses thir verse 13, which says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Temptations come from Satan. But trials come from God, as Psalm 66.10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. First Peter 1 6, verses 6 and 7 similarly mentions that these tests or trials reveal our faith like a fire that refines precious gold. I quote, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than, than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God's faithfulness, by the way, I want to clarify, to his people is perfect. Even though man's faithfulness to God is imperfect. The Christian's bar of soap verse is a great example of that, where in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 3 3 even says, But the Lord is faithful. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one? Um, although understanding the attacks of or sorry, although withstanding the attacks of Satan is an enduring struggle of faith, where Ephesians six sixteen compares it to a shield, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Ephesians. You can read more in Ephesians six ten through eighteen or. Or Philippians 4, 12 through 14, if you want to look into that more. Faith is a spiritual gift, by the way. 
And we gain it through hearing the word according to Romans 10:17. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Also, it would seem we could pray for faith, similar to how the disciples asked Jesus in Luke 17:5, And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, after spending the beginning of this chapter looking at the Israelite failures, I wonder if Paul's hinting out how they still failed when tempted within their means, and therefore we will still fail when tempted within our means. Just remember, whenever we fail, repent. Apologize to God and to those you hurt. Turn away from doing it again, so, and turn towards better thoughts of God. As 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we should, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Yeah. Now, I have heard some say that the best way to defeat temptation is to stay in the temptation and use sheer willpower to overcome it because you'll increase your willpower or something like that. But we are finite beings with finite wills, and the multiple times the Bible talks about fleeing. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry. Uh, and so, <laughs> fleeing, like we see here, is found in Second Timothy two twenty two, where Paul tells his younger minister, "Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart." Similarly, First Corinthians uh, six eighteen, earlier in this book, tells us to flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now, can we go ahead and get a reader for verses 16, 17, and 18 for me, please? <laughs> I would really appreciate it. Um, uh, is Lo- Lone Wolf Soldier raising your hand? Or no? I'm, no. I'm just resting my hand. Okay, you're good. Hand. Just resting it. Uh, anyone else would like to read? Red Shirt has come forward. I uh, see you, Sassy. I'll, do, I'll pick you next. Red Shirt, go ahead and read 16, 17, and 18. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Uh, yes. So, <laughs> wow, that's a really good one. Um, I do want to apologize. Earlier, I did use the phrase um, that with the whole bronze serpent, that it was raised on a cross. And according to that section, Numbers 21, uh, verse 9, Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. So it might not necessarily have been a cross, but still... The act of looking at that bronze serpent uh, would pre- uh, heal anyone of the venom that the serpents that were biting them had. So, thank you for the clarification, Lily Ender Dragon. I really appreciate it. And that's a great example that you shouldn't necessarily trust everything that your favorite Bible teacher says, but you should be like, I think it's the Bereans, if I remember correctly, but I'm um, the Thessalonians or something, the Bereans, um, where they would check, hear the Paul with all openness of mind, but then they would go back on their own time and check the scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul said were so. And so I encourage you all, you know, if you have the opportunity afterwards, check what I'm saying. Or if you're, if there's anything that you want to change your life based off of, because ultimately scripture should change your life, go double check that what that, that teacher said was correct. So that way you can live off of it from your own knowledge and your own experience. So thank you, Leander Dragon. I really appreciate the, the, the uh, correction. 
Uh, continuing on with uh, the uh, 16, 17, and 18, when we get to verse 17, the pra- we're, the 16, 17 is talking about communion. The practice of communion, where the entire church eats of the same bread and liquid together, represents how we are one big family under Jesus, consuming what Jesus gave us, kind of like a big Thanksgiving table where the whole family comes together. Some talk about how the process to create bread and wine is also symbolic of the church, how individual grains of wheat are ground together to make one new piece of bread, or how individual grapes are smashed together to make one bottle of wine. Additionally, we all partake of one bread of life, which is Jesus. Who in Matthew 26, 26, eloquently puts it, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, when we get to verse 18, Paul is kind of trying to compare, you know, wants us to look at how the Israelites dedicated, you know, would do the offerings. In the Old Testament sacrifices, the offering was on behalf of all who ate. Leviticus 7, verses 15 through 31 is where you can look to get more info on that. By such action, the people were identifying with the offering and affirming their devotion to God, to whom it was offered. Paul was, by this, implying how any sacrifice made to an idol was identifying with and participating with that idol. Even if that idol is not anything, it is bad for believers to participate in any such worship for the conscience of those around, which will be explained in verse 28 ahead. But yeah, we'll go ahead and move on to verses uh, 19, 20, and 21, and I'll ask for uh, Sassy Sully to go ahead and read that for us. Thank you so much. What am 19, 20, 21. That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather, that the thing which the de- Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, and not to go, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, Paul is using this as a almost a transition from, you know, verse 18 on, talking about how... <laughs> switching topics to explain how he is not saying that eating food offered to idols makes you a worshiper of the idol. Only when you eat a food offered to the idol with the intent to worship the idol does it become an act of worship to the idol. However, for the sake of unbelievers who don't understand that distinction, don't eat a food offered to idols so that they know you are not worshiping idols, so they may worship the true God instead. Paul has already explained that idols are nothing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, where he says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other god but one. Rather, um, when we move on to <laughs> the next part, uh, verse 20, where it's talking about how they sacrifice to demons, this implies that any idol that is worshipped is actually worshipping demons. So don't. Don't worship demons. You're not worshipping God by worshipping an idol, even if that idol is a statue of a cross. And Paul calls demons principalities and powers which have power to separate us from the love of or which sorry, which have no power to separate us from the love of God in Romans uh, chapter eight verses thirty eight and thirty nine, which says, "For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God." Which is the well, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and so that just wants to emphasize even further that, in a way, these idols are nothing; they will not be able to separate you from the love of God. 
when we get to verse 21, another way to think about you can't serve God and demons at the same time, like some New Age people want to do, Matthew 6.24 puts it well. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon being an old English term for money, by the way. So yeah, I get another reader for uh, verses 22, 23, and 24 over here. Um, go ahead and come forward. Go ahead, these last bits. Aha! Go for it, Lee Le- 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 Wood. Read 20, 20, <laughs> 22, 23, and 24. Although, although, we uh, repent the blood of Jesus. Are we stranger that then he, 23, all things are lie for, for me, but not all things are helpful all things are but but not all things any 24 the last one let let know let know let's know one seek his own, but each one the other is well being. Thank you for reading. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Even and sometimes it is helpful to read the word slowly too, um, because then it helps us really to get everything out of what is being said. So I really appreciate that attention to detail. Uh, if you when we look at Verse 22, I I wouldn't want to provoke God to jealousy because I doubt we are stronger than God, especially just after reading those verses, seeing God cast deathly judgments upon the people of Israel. Now, when we get to verse 23, where it talks about not all, the, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful, I'm gonna, just going to give you an example. Although it is lawful to spend the rest of my life playing chess... Is that profitable or helpful becomes the question. Not unless you're using chess to love others well. Because others will know that we are disciples because of how we love one another. And that, and we want to show God's love to others. Um, Romans fourteen nineteen encourages us to focus on things that edify or build one another up, just like this passage, where it says, "Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another." And then when we get to uh, verse twenty four, <laughs> you know. Seeking the well-being of others, Romans 15.2 is very similar and, and connects seeking the well-being of others with the chance to edify or build up the other in the Lord. And I quote, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And great business people always negotiate to make sure both sides benefit, looking to the well-being of others. There's something to keep in mind. Can I get a read? For 25, 26, and 27. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, do, do, do. Mm, looks like everyone's getting ready to read again, it looks like. Um, Lily Ender Dragon, since you let us off earlier today, let's go ahead and have you reread 25, 26, and 27. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no question for. Conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, 
and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you. Ask no question for conscience sake. So what's really cool about this, and I'm, and I'm going to be very brief because it's very self-explanatory. Twenty, Verse 26, he's quoting directly from Psalms 24, verse 1, but multiple times, Psalms 50, verse 12, and Psalm 89, 11, talk about how the earth is God's in all its fullness. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, can I get another reader for 28, 29, and 30? Uh, I'll probably do forgetful ferret, I think. Yeah, let's do that. 28, 29, and 30. Yeah. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Exactly. If the other person is going to make an issue of it, pass on the food offered to idols. If the other person doesn't make an issue, don't worry about it. The issue isn't your own conscience, but the conscience of the one serving you food offered to idols. Now, I doubt many of you will find yourself in this position, but something that could happen would be like a friend, while you are at their house, asks you to burn incense for the gods before the meal. Although me burning incense at my home for the sweet smells would be fine, the act of doing it at their house would communicate I'm worshiping their gods. And I would refuse to do it or participate in hope that they see my changed life is due to our god, not theirs. Otherwise, it gets muddied if you're trying to, you know, if you start worshiping their gods, they'll attribute, oh, our god, my gods is the ones that are helping you out, you know? And that we want people to see that God, the Father, you know, and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is the one making a life change, not theirs. Um, and this can also be really hard sometimes especially when a friend is marrying a non-Christian who wants the entire audience to participate in traditions to get the God's blessings for their marriage. Just respectfully excuse yourself from the part of the ceremony that's worshiping the other gods, so you are not seen as worshiping their idols for their conscience sake. Uh, I'll go ahead. We got our last section for today. And can I get the last reader for today? Uh, right over here. Feel free to come over and raise your hand and come forward. Uh, it looks like Silver 505 is jumping up with excitement. So I'll have you read 31, 32, and 33. Devil. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the truth, or to the Greeks, or to the church of God. Just as I also please of men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Yeah, <laughs> so... Verse 31 is a verse worthy to be memorized, because when we declare Jesus as our Lord, he is our ruler, our master, our boss, our supervisor, our commander. He is the one we follow orders from and live to please. So let us in all our doings glorify God. And what's cool about that verse is it's almost a, co a copy of Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. First Peter 4, verse 11, similarly says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And this is similar to also Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And I'll tease, Proverbs actually goes the extra step of letting you know when you always acknowledge God and what you do, God will direct your later paths, making your next steps clear as you take them. When we get to verse 32, uh, Paul considers the Jews, Greeks, and Church of God as three separate groups. The Paul would not consider a person of the church a Greek or a Jew anymore, as seen in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this makes sense, because when you decide to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're turning away and cleansing yourself of the old way of living, as we already talked about with baptism, so that you can commit your life to God, because you've repented of the old ways of living. And when we get to verse 33... The end of all these things is we don't want others seeing us participate in the worship of others besides God, so that they may realize that our God is the one that saves, and is making the life changes in us all. Paul's goal was to save the soul. And on that note, if you want to start your journey to know how great God's love is for you, we have people here who would be willing and excited to pray with you. Red shirt over there, Sentinel One, chat for green. Uh, Alina, if she comes back after her batteries recharged or something, um, they would all be excited to pray for you. And I'll also be available for questions and prayer over at that couch over there. Uh, if you're uncertain about following God for the rest of your life and declaring him as your Lord and Savior, I beg you to pray for God to reveal himself to you. If you have been pursuing God for a while, and don't hesitate to get prayer for whatever you are going through, because we have the opportunity to boldly go before the throne of grace at any time. So let's not pass up this opportunity to receive more mercy and grace. So thank all of you so, so much much for coming and i'll go ahead and close us in a word of prayer dear god thank you so so much for a good uh, a smooth teaching um and thank you for so many opportunities for new people to hear your word today we pray for those who were kicked that you would show your love to them and that you would uh, reveal yourself to them and that we would find new ways uh, to be able to love them well. And we pray for all the people that stuck out the longer teaching today that you would bless them um, with understanding these words, that you would help them to meditate and think about your, you know, First Corinthians 10 and beyond so that they may be able to live a more fulfilling life, a, a, a character closer to the character of Jesus Christ. And maybe it'll have, take wise choices throughout their days. And finally, we pray for all the people in virtuality and VR chat, that you would give us opportunities to show God's love and to help get them connected directly to your love, God, with a relationship with you, God, directly. In your powerful, precious name, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and Holy Spirit. Amen.